Hello? We're going to be using Noon Setting Daily Prayer, page 296 in the Lutheran Service Book. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Listen to my prayer, O God, do not ignore my plea. Hear me and answer me. Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. Cast your cares in the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our psalm will be Psalm 106, and this will be the first half of the psalm. So this is um, Psalm 106, beginning at verse 1, going to verse 23. Uh, so this psalm is looking into the history of Israel and the contentious nature of the people of Israel and God's response. So Psalm 106, beginning at verse 1. Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Who can proclaim the mighty acts of the Lord or fully declare his praise? Blessed are they who maintain justice, who constantly do what is right. Remember me, O Lord, when you show favor to your people. Come to my aid when you save them, that I may enjoy the prosperity of your chosen ones, that I may share in the joy of your nation and join your inheritance in giving praise. We have sinned, even as our fathers sinned. We have done wrong and acted wickedly. When our fathers were in Egypt, they gave no thought to your miracles. They did not remember your many kindnesses, and they rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. Yet he saved them for his name's sake, to make his mighty power known. He rebuked the Red Sea, and it dried up. He led them through the depths as through a desert. He saved them from the hand of the foe. From the hand of the enemy he redeemed them. The waters covered their adversaries. Not one of them survived. Then they believed his promises and sang his praise. But they soon forgot what he had done and did not wait for his counsel. In the desert they gave in to their craving. In the wasteland they put God to the test. So he gave them what they asked for, but sent a wasting disease upon them. In the camp they grew envious of Moses and of Aaron, who was consecrated to the Lord. The earth opened up and swallowed Dathan. It buried the company of Abiram. Fire blazed among their followers. A flame consumed the wicked. At Horeb they made a calf and worshipped an idol cast from metal. They exchanged their glory for an image of a bull which eats grass. They forgot the God who saved them, who had done great things in Egypt, miracles in the land of Ham, and awesome deeds by the Red Sea. So he said he would destroy them. Had not Moses, his chosen one, stood on the breach before him to keep his wrath from destroying them. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. In effect, uh, what I just read was a summary of Exodus, <laughs> where uh, the people of Israel, even though God had called them to greater things of the promised land, they doubted God, they doubted him, even despite God's works for them. Uh, they sinned and rebelled uh, almost every single step of the way. But... Uh, God was still delivering them, uh, still even allowing Moses to intercede on their behalf so they would not be completely destroyed. Uh, the reason why they were rebelling was because they were sin sinners, uh, so sinners commit sins. And the psalmist, who's, who's speaking the psalm in verse 6, he says, We have sinned, even as our fathers did. We have done wrong and acted wickedly, uh, which kind of leads you into the whole description of what ha was happening in Exodus. So the psalmist is really saying, oh, we're sinners, we deserve what is wrong, but the psalmist is also trying to say, well, remember us, O Lord, deliver us from our sins, forgive us so that we might be your people. Now, as we go into Job, this is going to be Job chapter 30. This is the second half of the chapter, verses 16 to 31. Uh, Job is going to be looking into his own situation with God and he can't necessarily find an origin point for his particular despair. But I'll get into that and maybe even correspond a little bit uh, more in depth to Psalm 105 as we continue. So Job chapter 31, beginning at verse 16, going to the end of the chapter. 
And now my life ebbs away. Days of suffering grip me, night pierces my bones, my gnawing pains never rest. In his great power God becomes like clothing to me, he binds me like the neck of my garment, he throws me into the mud, and I am reduced to dust and ashes. I cry out to you, O God, but you do not answer. I stand up, but you merely look at me. You turn on me ruthlessly. With the might of your hand you attack me. You snatch me up and drive me before the wind. You toss me about in the storm. I know you will bring me down to death, to the place appointed for all the living. Surely no one lays a hand on a broken man when he cries for help in his distress. Have I not wept for those in trouble? Has not my soul grieved for the poor? Yet when I hoped for good, evil came. When I looked for light, then came darkness. The churning inside me never stops. Days of suffering confront me. I go about blackened, but not by the sun. I stand up in the assembly and cry for help. I have become a brother of jackals, a companion of owls. My skin grows black and peels. My body burns with fever. My harp is tuned to mourning, and my flute to the sound of wailing. This is the word of the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Despite Job's words describing something absolutely horrible in his life, uh, it is absolutely beautiful poetry, beautiful imagery, um, a beautiful sorrow, if you will. Now, Job, unlike the Israelites in Exodus, or even the psalmist who's describing those events, uh, Job is not guilty of sin. Of course, Job has sinned in the past. He is a sinner like the rest of us. And Job has admitted this fact a uh, number of times in his speeches already, where he admitted that there were sins in his youth, that uh, if he had sinned, what was that to God? Uh, kind of just saying that, yes, I'm a sinner. Um, uh, chapter 9, Job chapter 9, when Job makes a speech there, I would say that that's one of the clearest cases for Job confessing original sin, uh, or any speaker in the book of Job confessing original sin in the book itself. So Job recognizes that he is a sinner and that compared to a holy God, he is considerably sinful. However, he also knows that he does not deserve this. And this is the tension within the book, which I touched on many times before in previous devotionals, which is basically that Job can't be counted as a sinner because he is forgiven by God. Uh, when God is saying in the beginning of the book of Job that Job is blameless and upright, a man who, who fears God and shuns evil, God is doing this in light of what Job is doing on the earth. That is, Job is offering up sacrifices even on the off chance that his children may have sinned. So Job is extremely pious. He is constantly being forgiven his sin by way of faith. Uh, Job, at this point in time in the history of the earth, he's offering up sacrifices, the sacrifices are pointing forward to Jesus Christ our Lord, who will be the ultimate sacrifice for us. So Job, like us, is being saved by the grace of Jesus Christ through faith. So uh, Jesus, as being the supreme sacrifice of all, uh, his blood is applied to all those in faith. Uh, the sacrifice of his blood is being applied to us uh, by way of God's word, by way of sacraments, so that we may be saved. For the people of the Old Testament, this living before the time of Jesus Christ, this would be coming to them by way of the sacrifices, by way of faith, God's word given to them. Uh, man cannot live on, on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. So God, who was declared to the Israelites, to other peoples even before them, Job is not himself an Israelite, he's most likely an Edomite, uh, living around the same time as Moses or even before. So Job is quite apart from the sacrificial system of that, that God has given to Moses, but Job still recognizes that because he has sinned, a life must be paid for it, and that's why Job uh, offers sacrifices. So uh, a life is paid uh, and the blood is covering his sins. So Job recognizes that he's forgiven because God has forgiven Job through sacrifice. Uh, through, the, through his words, through his promises. So Job receives this by faith, and he is not guilty of sin in God's sight. Of course, Job does have shame, and still has the memory of his sins that he has conducted. And this is Job saying that, yes, he had sinned in, in his youth, but uh, he, he quite rightly recognizes that he is not guilty of that now. 
Now, many people will assume that Job, when he's accusing God of these things in this present section, that he's actually overstepping his bounds and that he's uh, actively sinning now, that he's doubting God. Uh, but that doesn't seem to be the way that things are depicted in other locations in the book, uh, especially once we get to Job's confession at the end, where he's where he's basically saying, and it's very difficult to to translate this. Uh, usually, it's translated as "I repent in sin and ashes," implying that Job has sinned. But the actual word is very rarely used for repent. In fact, uh, with that particular tense in in the Bible is only translated as repent for Job, which I find to be very inconsistent. Because every t every other time that it appears in that tense, it's translated as relent or comforted. Uh, even if we go to the New Testament and we find a mention of Job in uh, the book of James, James is saying that Job is, has been steadfast in his faith. So taking Job's Job's words at the end of the book, not saying that he is repenting, but that he is relenting of his position, that he is uh, even, even possibly comforted in his position by God. Um, recognizing uh, who God is by way of God's words, so Job may shift his position, which is how that, use, that word in, in Job chapter 42 is used elsewhere, because God is always using that word um, that Job is using there, where God and God doesn't repent of sins. So God would be relenting of a previous course of action and now moving to a different course of action. Um, and that's how that word is used. Uh, so given, given Job's testimony at the end of the book and God approving of Job there, God uh, moving Job back into prosperity at the end of the book. And then also uh, the New Testament witness with uh, St. James in James chapter 5 saying that Job is steadfast. Well, I would say that Job is actually being steadfast. So what does that mean when Job is talking about God in this particular section of the book? So Job is saying, now let's get the first few verses because I'll, I'll get back to them. But in verse 20, he's saying, I cry to you, O God, but you do not answer. I stand up, but you merely look at me. Now, is this something that is necessarily impious? Well, this is actually something that is voiced many other times in Scripture usually by the Psalms, where you have Psalms which are lamenting of certain actions. And even the Book of Lamentations is also talking about this to some extent, where the Book of Lamentations is mourning over how God has destroyed the people, uh, destroyed Jerusalem, um, and they are now entering into exile, that God has punished the people for their sins. Now, when we're looking at Lamentations or Lament Psalms, usually what we're finding is uh, people are hoping and desiring for God to deliver them, but they're not necessarily receiving an answer right now, which is why they're in lament. They're trying to find God, trying to find an answer that God would be given to, giving to them. So Job, as he's saying here, well, you do not answer, I stand up, but you merely look at me. Throughout the book, uh, throughout his speeches, Job has been asking for God to be with him, to, to speak a word to him so that Job may be restored. So Job is actually acting fairly piously, much like the psalmist, much like Jeremiah, who wrote Lamentations, uh, Job is actively seeking a word from God so that he might actually be restored. This is, this is the entire point of those psalms, uh, that even though you were experiencing evil, now you want prosperity. Uh, even the people in Psalm 105, the Israelites who were being afflicted by God, well, they had sinned, they turned away from God, God punished them, and then they turned back to God. So God's word given to them is itself punishment. But it isn't punishment for Job. And Job, he's trying to understand uh, the actions given to him. So what are these in punishment? Because if, if Job is merely saying, well, there's evil that has been done against me, uh, oh Lord, and you, you're not responding right away, well, that's the complaint of many Christians, uh, which is, oh, I have been afflicted by maybe a disease, maybe by uh, the loss of a loved one, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There's many different instances of, uh, of what this could be. And they're all asking, Lord, how, how do I, or, or, or uh, what can you say, give to me? Um, it's not as though God is not answering them, but not answering them in a way that they might like. The same thing with, uh, with those voicing the Lamentation songs, the Book of Lamentations, where they would like immediate response, but for especially for the people for Lamentations, uh, written by Jeremiah, 
uh, God will not restore them until the exile into Babylon is over, which will be decades in the future. The people voicing Lamentations Psalms, likewise, they might not receive an immediate answer. It may be quite some time before God restores them to a degree that they actually like. So for Job, and we know the end of the book where Job is actually restored, Job is saying, well, no, I'm not being answered now, and that's actually a fairly accurate statement, that God is not immediately giving him his word. Is God completely absent? No, God is not completely absent. And Job kind of recognizes this when he says, I stand up and you merely look at me. Well, God is definitely observing Job. God is always present with us. God is always he's here with us in this life. And God is desiring us to turn to him. Uh, as for the exact ways this works out in our lives, that, that differs from person to person and by the will of God. But by the will of God, he will come to you. But anyways, uh, Job is similar to the people in the Lamentation Psalms, similar to, uh, to, to the Book of Lamentations uh, and Psalm 105, which is talking about the uh, removal of the Israelites by way of sin by God, who, who was a punishment on them. Job is attributing his sufferings to God. So in verses 21 and on, he says, you turn on me ruthlessly with the might of your hand. You attack me. You snatch me up and drive me before the wind. You toss me about in the storm. You know, I know that you will bring me down to death to the place appointed for all the living. Uh, the word for death there is uh, Sheol, the underworld, the, the land of death, the land of the dead, uh, which would be true for, for all people at this point in time. All people would say that uh, you would be going down to Sheol because uh, the way had not yet been prepared to heaven by... But, uh, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, uh, Job is not necessarily completely without hope because when he's talking about going down to death and even um, kind of appointment in, in, in death, uh, prior in his speeches, this is in Job chapter 14, uh, Job chapter 14, we find Job saying, oh, that you would send me down to Sheol until your wrath has passed over me. And then you would appoint a time and remember me. So uh, Job actually does have some wishful hope that God will uh, deliver Job from the wrath that is in this world. And that will happen in a resurrection. So Job, even though he's talking about, I know that you will bring me down to that, the place appointed for all the living. It's not as though Job is saying this completely without hope. That he's, he is experiencing evil in this world, uh, suffering in this world. But Job may not necessarily be saying, well, I'm completely without hope. There is a possibility that God will rectify even death itself so that I may be brought into justice. Uh, something else that uh, Job is saying in uh, chapter 19, the famous, this, uh, I know my Redeemer lives passage, where basically Job is saying all of that. He knows his Redeemer lives and in the end, and, uh, the Redeemer will have his feet set upon the earth. And Job, even though his flesh be destroyed, He'd yet uh, his skin be destroyed, yet in his flesh will he he'd be uh, restored. And he will see God with his own eyes, he and not another. So Job actually has faith that there, there will be a mediating figure that he will be able to be brought out out of death in order for justice to continue. Uh, 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 a redeemer is actually somebody who would be in the courtroom <laughs> uh, in this day and age that would speak on behalf of others. So Job, when he's talking in, Job, in chapter 29, which is still part of this speech, uh, chapter 29 about his heyday, the great times before his sufferings, Job is talking about being the presence of others in, in the gatehouses, that he would speak and others would listen to him. Well, Job is actually talking about legal cases, that he's actually giving legal advice at that time. So Job is acting as, uh, for lack of a better term, a redeemer, uh, because this would be what redeemers would do, is they would actually try to redeem, to try and uh, free those in their families. So Job, recognizing what a redeemer is, what he has done in his past life, well, he wants this for himself today. So uh, as, as he was set in place in, in the gatehouses for the deliverance of others, so he wants, uh, so he thinks that God, being just and righteous, will not allow a situation where there is no person to speak on in his defense. 
So for now, he's suffering, and he attributes the suffering to God. But Job does not necessarily overcome. Now, uh, looking into what Job is saying, that God is the one who snatches him up, drives him before the wind, tossing him about in the storm. Uh, again, beautiful imagery, but horrible subject. <laughs> uh, Job is just being afflicted in this world. Well, that kind of moves away from some of the lament psalms, some of the, or even the Book of Lamentations or Psalm 105, because those typically deal with uh, looking at uh, God's punishment for sin. So they recognize that God is the one who is behind the action and is justly behind the action. And this really moves Job into something that is uh, a narrower uh, subsection of the psalms, which are complaint psalms. And in complaint psalms, um, the reason for destruction is never given. So the psalmist in those complaint psalms is saying, well, I'm afflicted. God is behind this. I don't know the reason, but I'll appeal to God anyways. <laughs> because God, out of his steadfast love, out of, out of his uh, uh, covenantal relationship with us, that he will restore me, who is afflicted, back to back to prosperity. Now, in those complaint psalms, this is similar to what Job is saying, where even though you can look upon the earth and see that your worldly persecutors, whether they be the natural elements, whether they be uh, um, physical enemies, maybe another nation, uh, whether these be even uh, spiritual adversaries, you could say. Um, a thing doesn't come up quite as often in the psalms as you might think. But, uh, yes, uh, different adversaries natural, personal, or, or spiritual. Uh, regardless, you recognize that God has control over the situation. So if, if you are being afflicted, it's because God has allowed it. And this is true of Job. So when you look into the very beginning in the book of Job, even though God is not the one perpetrating the evils against Job, that's Satan, uh, God has still allowed Satan to do so, allowing Job to be uh, tried as it will although God ultimately forbids Satan from taking Job's life, because all life belongs to God, therefore Satan has no control over that. So Satan can't kill Job. Now, Satan was able to kill Job's children, but Job, uh, uh, Satan still doesn't really have control over the children's lives. The children actually were forgiven because Job, as the head of the household, was offering sacrifices on their behalf. So in the same way Job is saved, same way we are saved, uh, the children were, of Job were saved by grace through faith. Uh, Job just enacting the sacrifices at the time so that uh, the work of Christ can, can be transferred to them. <clears throat> so the children, there's a bit of a hint in, the, in chapter 42, the end of the book of Job, that they will actually be restored to Job in the resurrection because uh, if when Job is restored... <coughs> uh, Job, when Job is restored, he receives double back what he had before. But he has only the same number of children as he did at the beginning of the book. So if Job receives double back, then there is a hint that the children that have already died will be restored to Job in the coming resurrection. So Job will definitely have double the amount of children in the end. So that's one of the hints that the uh, chapter 42 in the book of Job is actually looking towards the resolution of our faith and eternal life. So with uh, with those children, pretty much promised, uh, and I'll say pretty much because it's, it's more by implication than it is by direct word in the scriptures, that Satan was, able, was not able to take their lives. All lives belong to God, so if God wants to save somebody, they're going to be saved. Satan can't take that away. So, even though uh, Job is experiencing suffering even to the point of death, as he's lamenting here, uh, complaining here. And Job is seeing that God has allowed the situation to occur, and even attributing some of these actions to God himself, as many of the complaint psalms do, even though it's a, maybe a worldly enemy that's attacking the person, the psalmist. Uh, Job is still speaking in line with those types of comments, because uh, Job is recognizing that God is justice. He's been saying this throughout the book, 
and he wants justice to be carried out in a satisfactory manner. So even though Job is being afflicted now, he wants resolution. He wants to be saved. And the only way that that will happen is if Job goes directly to God. And this is what faith is all about, is bringing us into relationship, into access uh, with God. So um, sometimes I'd like to say relationship of faith, just to declare that, yes, we are brought into relationship with God, that there is an active and living relationship between us, that God is actively giving us uh, grace and forgiveness and love and all these things that you would hope for in a relationship. Uh, but as it's framed or, or describes in a couple of places in the New Testament, uh, faith is access to God in the sense that uh, God's grace given to us can only be received by faith. So faith is that which gives us access to God's grace, God's love, uh, all of all of what God wants to give to us. So if you have a relationship of faith, as Job has a relationship of faith, you want to actually be brought closer into that relationship. And if Job is actively trying to search for God, actively trying to talk to God, well, that's good. Uh, now, the difficulties with this I'll explore a little bit later on as we get into chapter 31, because Job... Um, shies away from the proper relationship of faith where he's not as intent on talking with God, trying to resolve the issue, but he's moving ever slowly to just trying to resolve his personal problems, which is more of the, uh, more of the position of the friends, that the friends are looking at you do good, you receive you've good, you do evil, you receive evil. And it's uh, based primarily on prosperity. So if Job is saying, well, I just want to be restored. Well, then he's moving away from a, an active delivery relationship with God to just a prosperity gospel similar to the friends. And, and I believe this is why the speaker Elihu, who comes up in chapter 32, right after the speech in Job, uh, why he's speaking against Job and why he's acting the part of the pastor saying, eh, Job, you're not saying quite what's right. Or, or at least Job's direction is a little bit off. But uh, let us continue. Uh, so Job is definitely thinking that he's going down to death. So I'll go back to the section I skipped over, verses 16 to 19. He says, uh, Now my life ebbs away, days of suffering grip me. Night pierces my bones, my gnawing pains never rest. In his great power, God becomes like clothing to me. And, we, and usually when we find that type of imagery in the New Testament, we find it to be very comforting. Because if we're in sin, we're, we're dead in our sins. So Jesus Christ placing clothing upon us, or we are being clothed with Christ in baptism, as it says in Galatians chapter 3. When, when we're clothed with Christ, that means that well, we're being delivered from death. We're being clothed with newness of life. This is also the imagery Paul uses in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where he's saying, well, uh, the imperishable will be clothed Sorry, the perishable would be clothed with the imperishable, with the unrighteous with the righteous. And Paul is saying, well, you'll be clothed. You'll, God will place clothing upon you so that you will not be counted according to your sins. You're not going to be in your deadness that comes along with sin, but you'll be in the life of God. In, in fact, eternal life going beyond what that you can find in this world, the, the evil stain of sin. And Job is definitely feeling that experience that, yes, he's being dragged down into death. Uh, not necessarily just because of uh, unforgiven sins. Job is feeling dragged down to death because, and I will maintain that this is more original sin, the sin that still lurks within the flesh that needs to be uh, fully destroyed, which will on uh, in our death, because if the body goes down into death, the body the body's sins will be dead. And when you are raised in newness of life, that is, you are resurrected from the dead, your body will no longer have that sin within it. The, the, the sin is already dead, already resulting in death. So why would the sin be raised back up with your flesh? That just doesn't make any sense. So when you're raised up from death and the resurrection to come, uh, all evil will be removed from you because that won't come up out of, the, out of the grave. So you'll just be clothed with Christ and you'll live forevermore with Christ. Again, this is... 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that we find uh, imagery like this. So, uh, for Job, who's, who's still experiencing original sin, and I said that he fairly clearly uh, says that in chapter 9, well, he's experiencing, well, uh, 
uh, going down to death. And Job will die, and, and it says so in chapter 42 that after uh, Job is restored, he lives another 70 years, and then he goes to rest with his fathers uh, in death. So uh, the clothing of God here, like we would probably associate this more so with, oh, God's giving us life, but Job, when he's saying, uh, in, great, in his great power, God becomes like clothing to me, he binds me like the neck of my garment, he throws me into the mud, and I'm reduced to dust and ashes. Uh, Job is kind of saying that the clothing that he has feels restricting, that it is uh, uh, harming him, actually. And he's thrown down so that this clothing will be stained. That he's thrown down into the in the mud and the dust and the ashes, that he's just clothed with death anyways. That God's clothing will result in death. And if we... Uh, Look into God's holiness. Well, what does God's holiness actually do? Well, it destroys sin. Uh, sin cannot stand in the presence of God, so if he's being holy among us, uh, then he's destroying our sins. And this is something that we quite enjoy. This is something. This is what the worship service is, a bit, is built around. It's built on basically the sacraments, because in the Lutheran worship service, we begin in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the remembrance of our baptism. So our baptism as coming to us and allowing us to come and worship of our God, that has made us holy. Uh, then immediately we're going into the confession absolution. And again, God is forgiving us our sins there, so we're made holy. And then we come to the Lord's Supper. Uh, after the word of God, the word of God also pronounces the gospel to us, so we're made holy by the gospel, the forgiving word of Jesus Christ. And then we come to the Lord's Supper, where uh, Jesus Christ bodily comes to us in the bread and wine, so that when we eat and drink the bread and wine, we receive his body and blood for the forgiveness of sins and the purification of our flesh, so making us holy yet again. So the entire worship service is about God coming to us so that we might be made holy, uh, removing us from our sins. But those who are sinful, if they are retaining their sins and they're holding on to them, well, for God to remove those sins in his presence, well, he has to remove the entire person, similar to how original sin in our flesh how it's still clinging to our flesh and needs to be put to death. Uh, if, if we still have original sin, this, this body must be destroyed so that the spirit may come from it, the, the spirit of that Christ is renewed must come from it, so that we can be perfect and holy, awaiting the time of the resurrection when the spirit can be placed into a holy body. For... For those who are retaining their sins, so not just original sin lurking within the body, but all the guilt of sin also working its way in the spirit, in the soul, in all other aspects of the self. Original sin is in all aspects of the self, but uh, I won't go into all the spiritual anthropology that I need to to probably explain that, unfortunately. I'll take far too long. Uh, the person's guilt, they're not only their original sin, but their actual sins. Actual sins are those you enact. So actual sins are enacted sins. So your actual and original sins are still within you, all over you, um, body, mind, spirit. And if you retain those, well, then all of you needs to be put to death. And there's nothing to draw out of that because all of it is affected by sin. So those who are unrepentant in God's presence will be put to destruction. So Job is imagining that this is happening to him, that he, the entirety of his self is being put to destruction because he doesn't see any other way beyond uh, um, the, the situation, his understanding of the situation. But we do know that even though the flesh is going down to destruction, that the clothing of God is, can be restrictive to us in a sense because it's bringing our bodies down to death, being clothed with Christ. Uh, we know that the body being put down to death is a good thing because that means that the original sin that remains within us, within us that is uh, allowing us to continue in temptations in this world, that that will finally be put to death. So God dragging the body down into the mud, into dust and ashes is a good thing, but um, uh, the spirit returns to the one who gave it, so we still have salvation from this. Jesus is the resurrection and life. Those in in him, though they die, yet shall they live. Uh, Jesus, who restores us, who brings us out of our guilt, out of the uh, guilt of sin, makes sure that we are no longer found guilty in God's sight. So even though the flesh must be put to death so that it can be raised in new life, 
We are never truly dead because, of, because Christ has saved us. So, um, continuing on, I'll, I'll go into verse 24. So, uh, Job says, Surely no one lays a hand on a broken man when he cries for help in his distress. Have I not wept for those in trouble? Has not my soul grieved for the poor? Yet when I hoped for good, evil came, and when I looked for light, then came darkness. So Job is contrasting uh, his righteousness with what he has received. And this is a common theme that has come up through Job's uh, speeches before, and this, this goes against everything the friends have been saying. Um, the actual turn of events. Now, now Job, similar to the friends, thinks, well, if I'm righteous, righteous... Good things should come to me. If I'm evil, then bad things should happen to me. This is this is what should be. This is what we're also promised in, say, like the book of Proverbs, which is very black and white. But when you get to the nitty-gritty of each individual situation, you see that the sinfulness of the world, the evils that are within the world, say, like Satan, who's afflicting Job, that they still bring evil to those who are righteous in God's sight. So Job is saying that I have been righteous. I have done what is right in God's sight. I have done good, but I've only received evil. So he's confused about this, as he's been confused throughout the book. Uh, but he's recognizing the truth of the matter, that this actually is happening. So what does Job do? Well, he has to go to God in order to find this out, which we get to in chapter 31. But I'll, I'll, I'll finish off the remaining verses in, in uh, chapter 30. So uh, he continues to verse 27. The churning inside me never stops. Days of suffering confront me. So Job is saying that this is not just uh, external to him, so it's not just the sickness on his flesh, but this is also a spiritual and mental issue. And when you find people who are threatened by disease, uh, usually it's not just, oh, well, my, I can't walk or think or do any other thing. It's because my flesh is destroyed, uh, being destroyed. I'm still really up there in spirit. Well, no, not always. Usually when somebody is given really bad medical news, let's say their flesh is being destroyed by cancer or, what, or any number of diseases, you're quite fearful. You're actually in a lot of spiritual turmoil. You're wondering, well, what's going to happen to me? Am I going to die? What about my family? What about my friends? Uh, what about my relationship with God? Am I truly in the faith that he's allowing these things to happen to me? So there can be a lot of issues secondary to this. So that's what Job is saying here, is that it's not just a uh, a superficial affliction to him, it is something that strikes deep to the core of his person. And Job continues, verse 28, I go about blackened, but not by the sun. I stand up in the assembly and cry for help. Now the blackenedness, people have associated this with Job's skin disease, that, that his skin is black. Now in another location in the book of Job, in one of his speeches, he kind of mentioned something related to his flesh and uh, saying that it is kind of blackened and deaded. So this might actually be referring to his, his skin, the, the destruction of his skin. But um, Job, Job kind of expands this out from just a superficial understanding of his affliction, just, just the flesh, but something beyond that. So Job says, well, in his innermost being, he's being destroyed. But if he stands up for the, in the assembly with this skin disease, well, what happens? He says, continuing on to verse 29, I have become a brother of jackals, a companion of owls. So he's not actually being accepted by the assembly. He's going out where there are animals, the rejected animals, the ones who are uh, looking to feast on the dead, those, those who are being cast off by society and, uh, and uh, those who will be uh, eaten by animals after death. So, so uh, Job is... Recognizing, uh, again, multiple spheres, so he starts off this section with God, so he feels alienated from God, that God is against him. And then this puts him in trouble in the spirit, and that puts him also at odds with uh, not only himself, because that, that's, that's the churningness within his body, uh, within his soul. That also moves it out to the relation of others, which Job went at length in the first half of chapter 30. So... Job is suffering on many levels, and he can't really stand it. So verses 30, 31. My skin grows black and peels, my body burns with fever. My heart is tuned to mourning, and my flute to the sound of wailing. 
So Job, after recounting, well, I have issues socially, bodily, spiritually, um, and, and in terms of faith relating to God himself, well, everything about me is tuned to mourning, to, to wailing. So if Job is making any sound at all, it is related to his distress. And that's a very horrible place to be in, especially when you're in faith, because you might actually feel betrayed by God, which is something that Job is trying to express similar to what the complaint psalms also are trying to express. And actually with the complaint psalms, uh, like Job, what they're trying to express is, I am in suffering. I can only see God is in control. Therefore, I go to the only one who is in control so that he may save me. So even if God seems to be the root of the problem, if, if only by way of his ability to, to have power over all things, not necessarily being the direct actor, because uh, Satan is attacking Job, not not God. Uh, Satan, uh, sorry, God allowed Satan to be tempted by the desires of Satan's own heart. So God is not saying destroy Job. God is saying do with Job as you will, and Satan is going yes, I will afflict Job. But uh, what Satan is supposed to do is Satan is supposed to act in a proper way to Job. Satan is actually supposed to come to Job so that um, Satan may examine him, because that's Satan's role. He's a prosecutor. That's what Satan means. He is the adversary, the opponent, the, one, the legal representative in court who's trying to accuse somebody of a sin. And Satan is supposed to look at Job, realize Job has done nothing wrong, and come back to God and say, oh, well, I was wrong about this guy. He's, he's completely fine. Well, what Satan actually does is he just tries to afflict Job, bring Job down into the worst places ever so that Job will actually now begin to sin. Not, not that Job's past sins, which have already been forgiven, not that uh, past undisclosed, unforgiven sins will be revealed, but that Job would actually just be destroyed in, in, his, in new grown sinfulness. So Satan's not doing what that he should. Similar to uh, other things in this world that are acting evil that they're given over to the desires of their own hearts and their own inclinations, and they're not doing what God has ordered and ordered them to do in the beginning. So uh, sin actually arises from sinners, those who are removed from God, removed from his grace, removed from his goodness. So even though God allows all things, and if, if you were saying, well, I'm experiencing evil because of God, well, it's not absolutely wrong in the sense that God does allow these things to occur. But... Uh, you can't say that, oh, Satan and God are identical in this scenario. Uh, I would say that, that, that would, there needs to be a distinction for that. So Job uh, and the complaint Psalms were say, would be saying, well, God is the ultimate cause of these things, so we need God to help us. So where does our help come from? Well, it comes from the same place that it always has, which I've mentioned a few times already uh, in this devotional where it is ultimately from God, especially through our Lord Jesus Christ. So even though Job is going through suffering now, what he can actually truly rely on is the past sacrifices that he was engaged in, because in those sacrifices, the sacrifice of Jesus blessed him. So Job, who is in faith, is continuously receiving the grace of God. He has access to God's love, God's grace there. So the forgiveness that can only be found in Jesus Christ our Lord will be given to Job by way of faith. Uh, Job has done what is good, what is righteous. Uh, he is not uh, sinning against God. So, of course, he's going to be saved by faith, uh, even if it's by the skin of his teeth, which is a phrase that Job also has, has coined. So, Job is has salvation. The people who are voicing the complaint psalms in Scripture they also have salvation, even though they don't know why they're being afflicted. Uh, they know that God will save them. So for us also, when we look into, well, how will we be saved? Well, we have to look to the one who saves us. Uh, constantly calling out for God, even though, as Job was lamenting, Job, uh, God might seem uh, far off, not actually answering us. We do know that God will eventually answer us uh, through the works of Jesus Christ, uh, even if it doesn't come up in this world, it will come up in the resurrection to come, when sin will finally be put to death completely, when sin within us will be put to death completely, when the body is put to death and sin with it. 
so that no longer will evil be present within God's paradise, God's world, but we will be moved into the new heavens, new earth, where sin is a thing of the past. Evil is a thing of the past. We have this promise given to us in our Lord Jesus Christ, and we live this out daily, uh, trusting in our Lord's promises despite our afflictions, because we know that he will save us, he will act according to his word, and he does what he says. Amen. We continue, page 296, with the Kyrie. O Lord, have mercy upon us. O Christ, have mercy upon us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, bless us through your works on the cross, and your work coming up from the empty grave, that we might not be lost in our sinfulness, but be forgiven, and that we may, might not be cast into death, but brought into new life. We ask you, O Lord, to guard our spirits so that even though the flesh may be destroyed, our flesh may be destroyed, yet will we have life in you. Please, O Lord, guide us to the resurrection from the dead that we might be with you for all eternity, rejoicing in, in your righteousness and our sinlessness for all time to come. Give us strength as we deal with the afflictions of this world when we feel that uh, our Lord is far from us, when God is not answering us in our prayers. Um, help us turn to Scripture, the, your word, so that we may know where you are, what you are doing, and may may receive all the promises that you make to us through Scripture. Please, O Lord, deliver us from evil and bring us into everlasting life. Amen. Heavenly Father, send your Holy Spirit into our hearts to direct and rule us according to your will, to comfort us in all our afflictions, to defend us from all error, and to lead us into all truth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.